Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is Morteza Hajizadeh from Critical Theory Channel. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with a very distinguished uh, scholar, Professor Naomi Oreskes, about a wonderful book she published with Bloomsbury Publishers. The book is called The Big Myth, How American Businesses Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. Professor, uh, the book is written by Professor Naomi Oreskes and also Eric uh, Conway. Uh, Professor Naomi Oreskes is uh, the Professor of History at si- uh, history of Science and Affiliated History of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. She has also published famous books such as Why Trust Science and Science on a Mission. And today she's here to talk with us about the big myth. Naomi, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, among the circle of my friends, uh, some of my friends know you, and you're famous as the Sherlock Holmes of intellectual history with the books such as uh, Merchants of Doubt and also this book, which I was just amazed. And I recently introduced it to another friend of mine, and he just couldn't believe a lot of the stuff he read in the book. And he had to double check, and it was just amazed after that. So the big myth, how American business taught us to load government. So can you please tell us how the idea of the book uh, came to you and why you particularly decided to write the book about this myth that the government is bad and and free market can fix everything? Sure. Well, that's a great question, especially because sometimes people say, you know, you're a scientist and a historian of science. So why are you writing now a book about market fundamentalism? So the answer is that this really came out of our work on merchants of doubt. So when Eric Connolly and I first encountered the phenomenon of climate change denial, we wanted to answer the question, why would intelligent, thoughtful, educated people reject climate science? Because that's what we were looking at. And the people we were studying uh, not only were not stupid, but some of them were very distinguished scientists in their own right, like Fred Seitz, who had been the president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So it was clear from the very beginning that this was not a story of public understanding of science, not a story of scientific illiteracy, but it had to be something else. And what we discovered through our research, through reading their own articles, their own letters, their letters to each other, was that it was really about ideology. Um, And it was specifically the ideology of the free market, the idea that we should just let markets sort these things out. And then if government intervenes, and I want to put the word intervene in scare quotes, because I think even that concept of intervention is misguided, and the new book addresses that, but that if the government, um, in their view, intervenes or interferes in the market, it distorts the marketplace, um, and it makes things just worse. And so government should get out of the way and let the market do its magic. And we thought that was pretty astonishing because it was pretty obviously that that strategy was not working for climate change. And it was pretty obvious that it hadn't worked for the other issues that they had got involved with, like acid rain, which was solved through laws and treaties, or the ozone hole, which was you know um, solved through the UN Framework Convention on the substances that... Um, deplete stratospheric ozone. So the, we had these earlier examples where government action had been crucial to protecting people from harmful products or really serious environmental threats like the ozone hole. So we. So then the next question was, well, where did that set of ideas come from and why did they believe those? So that would have been too much to answer in Merchants of Doubt. Uh, Merchants of Doubt was a pretty contained story that had a pretty clear, had a very clear beginning and middle and kind of a clear end. So we just ended the book. We, you know, put a line under it, but it was always there in the back of our minds that that question was still was still hanging about. And so we tossed the idea around for a number of years. We thought about a few other different things that we might write about, but ultimately we kept coming back to this question: Well, where did this idea of market fundamentalism come from, and why do so many people believe it, especially in the United States? I mean, I can't tell you how many airplane rides I've been on when, if I tell the person next to me what I do for a living, they'll say, "Oh, well, but you know, governments just mess things up. You just have to let the market sort it out, or technology in the free market will solve it." And this is a very widespread belief, and so we wanted to better understand where this belief had come from and why so many people accepted it, even though it was obviously patently, at best it was a half truth and at worst it was a myth, which is what we have concluded it is. Uh, that, that, that's a great introduction. And I'm absolutely sure you might have been called a communist at some point by some people. Of course. Because, you know. right. <laughs> anyway. Well, and that, 
you know, if I could just say something, but that's part of the story too, because one of the things we yeah. show in the book is that part of the way the myth of the free market works is through the false dichotomy that either we have unregulated markets or we're communists and there's no middle ground. And it's that dichotomy that then informs so much of free market thinking. So yes, absolutely. The minute you question anything about the operation of capitalism as it operates in the world today, you get accused of being a communist. Mm -hmm. And I was reading a book some time ago on the, on the history of liberalism and how liberalism turned to be an Anglo-American ideology, whereas it started in France and then it was developed further in Germany. And the uh, yeah, and, and and the first and the second world war, and of of course Stalin, that didn't help much. And and I, I will talk about New Deal and Roosevelt's New Deal. I guess that that's where we can better talk about this issue. Anyhow, but the the idea of free market in your book is it correct that the concept of free market is somehow relevant to 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 the U.S. Constitution? Because you discuss some misinterpretations um, uh, of 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 the 18th century philosophy, even of Magna Carta. Can you talk about that in your book and how this idea of economic freedom beca became synonymous with liberty? A key part of the story is really looking at how this mythology rewrites history and misrepresents history, particularly the history of the United States. So a significant part of the book deals with a trade organization called the National Association of Manufacturers, who in the 1920s and 30s were the largest trade association in the United States, representing factory owners who manufactured cars, light bulbs, carpets, all kinds of different things. So General Electric, for example, was an important member. DuPont was an important member. And so they begin to develop this concept, which they call the tripod of freedom. And the argument is that freedom, American freedom has three legs, or American democracy has three legs. One is the notion of representative democracy. The second is, are the civil and political rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, et cetera. And the third, they claim, is free enterprise. And so using the metaphor of a tripod, they claim that if you weaken any one of the legs, the whole structure will tumble. Now, this is not used as a defense of representative democracy or voting rights, or they don't launch voter registration campaigns. It's used as an argument to defend what they call economic freedom. And to say that if we undermine economic freedom, that de American democracy will be threatened. And so they use this then to push back against progressive era and then later New Deal reforms, such as minimum wage laws, laws to limit child labor, um, laws to increase workplace safety. Now, so one of the questions that comes up is, well, is, is there any truth to this? And so we argue in the book that there isn't, that this is really a fabrication. And it's a fabrication on two levels. First of all, the whole expression free enterprise was actually invented by these people. Prior to the 20th century, people didn't talk about free enterprise. They talked about private enterprise. The National Association of Manufacturers decided, well, a lot of people don't really like private things. And this is an period in American, American history when big business has a bad reputation because of the um, problems of the Great Depression and the, the um, excesses of the roaring 20s. So they decided to promote the idea of replacing the term private enterprise with free enterprise, because a lot of people don't like private things, but they do like freedom. And this sort of manipulation of language is something that we see throughout the story. The choice of words that are designed to appeal to American values and sensibilities like freedom. But it's also false because if you actually know anything about US history, or if you read the Declaration of Independence, you see that neither private enterprise nor free enterprise are mentioned anywhere in any of these founding documents. The Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights do not protect private enterprise. This is just an invention. Now, in fairness, some people have said to me, well, okay, that's true, but the Constitution or the, uh, does certainly mention property, and we certainly um, have you know the respect for private property as a founding concept in liberalism, particularly, as you said, Anglo-American liberalism. But private property and enterprise are not the same thing. And so that I think that's not a legitimate criticism. So it is true that the US Constitution says no person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, right? So you actually can be deprived of property as a punishment for violating the law. But the notion of free enterprise is a much more capacious idea that business broadly construed should be pretty much given free reign, that allowing business to 
operate in an unconstrained manner is good for American democracy and good for freedom and good for the economy. And we have enormous amounts of evidence that that's simply just not true. And, and I guess one of the philosophical foundations for this idea, or at least the way they have appropriated this, is Adam Smith, uh, Adam Smith's book, uh, Wealth of Nations. And you talk about how, I think it's George Stigler's version of Adam Smith is, is is cherry picking of quotes. Can you talk about the the way he edited the book? And I guess that's the book we, we have available, right? A lot of people pick up and read. Exactly. So this is one of my favorite parts of the book, one of my favorite things to talk about, because so much of this book is really about how ideas are misrepresented. And we show in this book that in many cases, these misrepresentations are clearly deliberate. So it's not that these people don't understand Adam Smith. And I'm quite certain George Stigler was a very brilliant economist. I'm quite sure that he had actually read all of The Wealth of Nations. And, you know, just today I was reading an article that quotes the famous line from Adam Smith about it's not out of, you know, what's the what's the word Smith says? It's not out of benevolence or generosity that the butcher or the baker do what they do. It's out of self-interest, right? And so this idea that Adam Smith built a conception of capitalism based on self-interest and based on this sort of magic trick that doing things for selfish reasons somehow miraculously creates the common good. And that's the version of Adam Smith that almost all of us have been taught. And it's tied up with this notion of the invisible hand, which is this sort of semi-religious mystical notion um, that the reason this works is because the invisible hand is arranging everything in this very wonderful, benevolent, uh, beneficial fashion. But if you actually read The Wealth of Nations, what you see is a really very different story, that Adam Smith has a much more nuanced view of what has to happen for capitalism to work. And yes, it is true, he does think that if you look at the individual baker or the individual butcher, that that baker or that butcher are working to support themselves and their family, so they're working fundamentally out of self-interest. But he also says, that that approach only goes so far because there are some areas of the economy where self-interest can actually not only be harmful, but actually can threaten the health of the entire society. And he uses banking as the example. And especially in light of what has happened in the world, you know, in our lifetime, I mean, every undergraduate should be required to read Adam Smith's discussion of the perils of unregulated banking. And he goes on at quite great length about why banking must be regulated and he even goes further and he says, well, okay, some people are going to say this is an infringement of freedom. And I thought that was so interesting to read that the very same arguments that are being used today were used against Adam Smith in 1776. And he says, well, look, it is an infringement of freedom. Of course it is. Society cannot function if everybody just does what they want. Right. So the very thing that his acolytes think he's arguing for, he explicitly says he's not. And he says, um, so when is it legitimate to infringe on freedom? When the liberty of one group threatens the safety and security of the whole. And I just think that's such an amazing sentence. It explains so much. And yet that's a sentence you never hear quoted in the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. And you won't find it in Stigler's version of The Wealth of Nations. So he gets rid of all of that. And he gets rid of all of the places in the book where Adam Smith talks about the limits of competition and why you need to have remedies. So Adam Smith talks about the need for minimum wages. He says factory workers, factory owners, if you leave it to their own device, they will pay literally starvation wages and the children of workers will starve, which we know they did in the 18th century. So you have to have minimum wage laws. And he even says, and the factory owners being more powerful they'll collude to keep wages low. So workers need to have some remedy for that. So he doesn't talk, he doesn't use the language of unionization. That doesn't really come until the late 19th century. But he essentially says workers have to work together to stand up for their rights because they cannot trust the factory owners to be fair to them. And then he also has a long discussion of the need for taxation to pay for public goods. And all of this all of it is left out of the University of Chicago version of the Wealth of Nations. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And, and again, in the past few years, I guess there have been a couple of books on Adam Smith. And when I, I started with an article about that story of Invisible Hand, and again, when I was reading more about liberalism and in the book that I was reading, there were lots of references to the need to individual freedom and the responsibility of the individual towards society. So there were some quotes from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And when I uh, 
picked up the original book to read those quotes, I just couldn't believe it. You could easily argue. I mean, I know that it's a bit anachronistic, but it could easily argue, look, he was a lefty, right? He was a communist <laughs> because he's absolutely... Well, and actually, and in his yeah. day, a lot of conservatives, I mean, Edmund Burke hated Adam Smith. Yeah. He was considered something of a liberal progressive in his era. So, and I think the reason we don't know that is because we've been given this very distorted view of, of who Adam Smith mm. is. The other piece that's worth noting on this, and you're an intellectual, so this is fun to raise. So in the late 19th century, there was an academic discussion in Germany. Maybe you know about this. It was called Das Adam Smith Problem. And so there were economists who were trying to reconcile the Adam Smith of the wealth of nations with the Adam Smith of the theory of moral sentiments. And later... Academics have written about this, and there's a fairly large literature, actually, where people point to the book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, to say that Adam Smith was not the heartless capitalist that he's been made out to be. And so I think those papers and books and articles are important, but I think they've, um, in a way, yielded too much ground. They're, in effect, saying, well, if you only read The Wealth of Nations, you might think that Adam Smith was that person. But if you read his other work, you see, no, it's more complicated. Well, that's partly true, but I think that yields too much ground because I don't think you actually even have to read the theory of moral sentiments. You just have to read the wealth of nations, the whole wealth of nations, mm -hmm. and not the edited versions of it that we've been given. Um, you, you talked about National Association of Manufacturers. There is another association you discussed, National Electric Light Association. Can you tell us how it was formed? What was the mission? And they resist a lot of interventions from the government, especially when the government wanted to ask them to, to, to I guess, uh, build uh, electricity infrastructure in regional areas in the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about them and also how they funded uh, universities, uh, intellectuals, to talk about the benefits of private ownership? Neela is a very important part of this story. So this is the National Electric Light Association. And they're very important because it points out a really central aspect of this story, which is that the propaganda campaigns that we are writing about, the construction of this myth about the magic of free markets, is a response to the truth, which is the truth of market failure. So we begin the book by talking about a number of market failures. And one of the important ones in the early 20th century in the United States is electricity. So electricity in the United States was developed as a private enterprise, a private sector activity. And that was quite different from many other countries, for example, New Zealand, uh, Japan, M Germany, France, where it was developed as a public utility. So in Europe and other parts of the world, most people, as electricity became available, it began to be viewed as a necessity, like water. Um, and, and so many countries felt it was obvious that governments had to become involved in the distribution of electricity so that everyone would have electricity in the same way that everyone would have water or sewers. But in the United States, where, and admittedly, the U.S. has always sort of tended more towards a kind of free market or private enterprise orientation than, than some other countries in the world. In the United States, it was developed by the private sector. And the private sector did a really, really good job of bringing electricity to people in big cities, New York, St. Louis, Chicago, San Francisco, but they did not bring electricity to rural customers. And the reason why was simple. They couldn't make a profit in rural areas because the debt the density of people was too low to cover the cost of bringing transmission lines out to those towns and villages. And so people in rural areas had no electricity by and large. A political movement began to develop to address that, to say, yeah, that's not okay. Rural people need electricity just as much as urban people. And if anything, they need it more because if they're farmers, they could really use electricity to improve, um, you know, to do farming work and, and to, decrease the labor load. I mean, a lot of electricity use in cities was for things that were fun, but not necessarily necessary, like cinema or um, electric lights at the World's Fair in St. Louis. These were fun things, people enjoyed it, but you wouldn't really say that was a necessity. But if you're a hardworking farmer, having electricity to help you do your work could really be viewed as, an as a necessity. So a political movement developed to support and promote the development of government run electricity programs in the United States. And in response, the electricity industry, represented by its trade organization, NILA, organized a massive propaganda campaign to fight back, not just against 
the idea of municipal electricity. So this would be electricity that was being generated by towns or cities or on the state level. So Pennsylvania had a program called Giant Power to develop and distribute electricity in Pennsylvania. But to discredit any government role in the marketplace and to promote free market economics. In, in other words, really to shape what Americans thought, not just about electricity, but about the whole question of the role of government in political economy. And they did this in a number of ways, but the one that I think was most pernicious and scary it was something, a, a curriculum and academic program designed to change what was taught in schools, colleges, universities around the United States, to rewrite textbooks to support a laissez-faire free market ideology, and also um, to develop curriculum in emerging business schools, including Harvard. And in this case, we actually found the receipts. <laughs> we found canceled checks in the archives. The National Association and National, National Electric Light Association paid for Harvard to develop a course on electricity regulation that was a totally industry-oriented course, basically a course representing the industry view that electricity should not be regulated by the federal government. So they helped to develop curricula in business schools that were very one-sided, very slanted towards the orientations and interests of private enterprise. And there was no comparable course on you know, the orientation of labor unions or workers um, or anything like that. And uh, what about the reaction, not only Nilo, but also NAMP, that discussed to FRD's New Deal? Were they successful? What what were some of the, let's say, campaigns or uh, uh, things, obstacles they put in the way of uh, uh, New Deal? So the NILA campaign mostly took place in the 1920s. This debate about electricity was mostly a 1920s era debate, but it comes up again in the 30s with the New Deal, the late 30s and into the early 40s. And at this point, the argument gets taken up more. So NILA disbands. When, when this is exposed, NILA is viewed as discredited. And so they disband, although they later regroup as the Edison Electric Institute, which still exists today. But... This other group, the National Association of Manufacturers, essentially picks up the baton. And so they launch an even bigger propaganda campaign through the 1930s and 40s to fight the New Deal and to claim that the New Deal response to the Great Depression is un-American, socialistic, communistic. Mm. They accuse FDR of being a communist or a communist sympathizer. And they fight, they try to fight many of his reforms in courts, including electricity. So in the 1920s, the idea for rural electrification did not succeed, in part because of the NILA campaign. But it gets taken up again during the New Deal. And this time, it does succeed under the program known as rural electrification. And electricity is finally successfully brought to rural Americans across the United States, not by the private sector, but by the federal government. So it's actually a great success story of government activity. And it's a very clear example of a market failure remedied by government action in the marketplace. But the electricity industry fights it tooth and nail. And so in the book, we talk about how they hire a set of lawyers to fight rural electrification in court. Mostly they don't succeed. And they don't succeed in part because the American people really support the New Deal, because the Great Depression was truly devastating for America. And also because when they go to court, they do have some wins um, FDR doesn't get everything he wants, but he gets a lot of what he wants because in general, well, you know, courts are subject to politics too, even though they might want to claim they're not. So the, the, the tenor of the land, the overall feeling is that, yes, the government has to do something in the, in the face of this terrible thing. And then Congress passes a set of laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 that finally establishes a minimum wage and finally after decades of fighting, abolishes most forms of child labor. So NAM fights most of these things, but they don't win. The tide is on the side of government action to address these issues, but they don't give up. And so um, the middle part of the book sort of talks about what they do, how they regroup after 1945 and what they do to carry their message forward, even though they've essentially lost the argument over the New Deal. And the... Uh... Uh, another part of the book that I was just amazed to read was their battle to win the hearts and minds of people. And then you discuss several in initiatives they had, William Walker Fund, but again, the, and how they promoted Austrian classic liberal economies. But I was just amazed to 
uh, realized that they were the ones who helped uh, famous uh, Austrian economists such as Ludwig von Mises or Hayek to secure a university position in America. Can you talk about um, their battles of hearts and minds, let's say, and more specifically, these two famous economists, how, they, how did they end up in America and how did Nila help them secure those American uh, university positions? So as I just said, up until the 1940s, the American business sector is essentially losing this argument. The American people support the right of workers to collective bargaining and for minimum wage. And the American people, by and large, do not think there should be widespread child labor. So, but these folks don't give up. They don't say, okay, we're wrong, we lost. They realize that part of what they need to do is to find some way to give their arguments more intellectual credibility and to make them look less obviously self-interested. Because when a factory owner invokes freedom and democracy to defend child labor, you know, most people aren't buying that. It's pretty obvious that it's self-interested, it's hypocritical, and it's just wrong. But if they can find academics to help them make the case and give it intellectual credibility, intellectual gravitas, they reason, this could help change people's minds. And so starting in 1944, they embark on a program to bring influential European thinkers to America to promote these ideas. And the two people they identify as most sympathetic are the Austrian economists, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek. And this is extremely important because these two men are considered founders of the Austrian School of Economics, which is essentially a school of economics that says, trust markets, government get out of the way. So they find European theorists whose views are very sympathetic to their own, very congenial to the argument that they are trying to make in the United States. And it's quite ironic because these same people during the 1930s and early 40s consistently criticized socialism and communism as foreign theories. They even criticized the New Deal as being excessively influenced by foreign theories. But then they actually literally import foreign theorists to the United States to promote their views. So neoliberalism really is a foreign theory. It comes out of Europe, mostly out of Austria. And so these two key thinkers come to the United States. The people, the key people involved here are business leaders who have been associated with NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers, particularly a man named Jasper Crane, who had been an executive at DuPont, and a man named Harold Lunau, who headed up America's first libertarian foundation, an organization called the Volcker Fund, not to be confused with Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve, different, two different Volkers. So they actually pay for these men, von Hayek and von Mises, to come to the United States, and they arrange to get them hired at university. So there's no open search, there's no advertisement, but they work behind closed doors and they offer to pay the salaries of these men if the universities will have them. And so they, they find a position for von Mises at New York University, where he kind of does his thing for the rest of his life, but he's not super influential, but the more consequential story then moves to the University of Chicago, where they get von Hayek hired. And it's very interesting because they, had, they get him hired over the objections of the economics department. So the University of Chicago economics department always leaned in the direction of laissez-faire, but not nearly to the extent that it did in later years. And it was not nearly, you know, what we think of as the Chicago school really was only beginning to develop in the 1930s and 40s, but it gets this big boost from Jasper Crane and Harold Lenau. They get... Von Hayek hired over the opposition of faculty, and they do it by agreeing to pay for his salary, so it won't cost the university anything. And they launch something that they call the free market project. And the idea is that they will hire a group of faculty, a cadre of faculty, who will do academic work to promote the idea that markets are rational, that markets are efficient, and that the best way to run a society is through a, a kind of laissez-faire economics. And so they, this project, they fund this project, and through this project, two or three or four very important additional people are hired. One is George Stigler, who we've already talked about. Another is Milton Friedman, probably the most famous economist in the 20th century. Also Robert Bork, who becomes the architect of, um, he's part of a project called the Antitrust Project, but it should really be called the anti-antitrust project because it's a project to persuade the courts that they should not enforce antitrust statutes. Um, and then his advisor, Aaron Director, who also plays a big role in constructing and 
a legal and political argument against antitrust enforcement. And they go on to become extraordinarily influential. And in the book, we show some very specific ways in which their arguments are taken up by judges who, for example, throw out uh, antitrust suits on the basis of these Chicago school arguments. Um, there, there is also this um, uh, liber American libertarian think tank, uh, a foundation of economic education, which was established in 1946. And I don't think they are very happy with your book. I think no. they, they are not. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, FDR always said he welcomed the hatred of the right people. So I mean, <laughs> that welcome their hatred. But if I've got under their skin, that's probably a good sign. Yeah, yeah. I think they published something on the website. I, I didn't read it. It was too vitriolic. And I could tell they hadn't really read the whole book. But anyway, can you talk about that and also Mont's uh, Peril in Society? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so one of the things we show in the book is that there's multiple strands of activities going on and many of them are interconnected and interrelated. So another one of the key players in the National Association of Manufacturers is a man named J. Howard Pugh. He's the same man that the Pugh Foundation and Pugh Charitable Trusts are named for, although their politics there are quite different from what his politics were. So Pugh is very powerful. He's extremely rich. He's the president of Sun Oil Company, which today is known as Sunoco. And he is extraordinarily reactionary extraordinarily right-wing, highly anti-Semitic and highly anti-Catholic. He would probably have been anti-Islam too if that was an issue in America in those days, but it doesn't really come up. He's very vitriolically anti-Catholic. And so he becomes concerned about um, the way in which liberals and progressives, but also mainstream American Protestants are turning against capitalism or what he sees as a turn against capitalism. And he thinks that the business community needs to do more to shore up intellectual support for capitalism, and particularly, you know, a certain version, a certain way of thinking about capitalism, which is this extreme free market Austrian school that any government action in the marketplace is a threat to freedom. So he becomes involved in a, a couple of different initiatives. And one of them is helping to support uh, what most people would say is the first libertarian think tank in America, the Foundation for Economic Education. And as you said, they still exist today. They heavily promote von Mises, they promote von Hayek, they promote Milton Friedman. So a lot of their work is the promotion of the work that we have just been talking about, um, the work that the business community has helped to foster and nurture in America. And so they become involved in a whole set of, quote, educational activities, but which we think are more propagandistic than educational. And then Pew also supports a religious arm of this activity called spiritual mobilization. And this is one of the most interesting parts of the story, actually, and I think explains a lot of things that have happened in America in the last few decades. So one of the things that Pew is particularly worried about is that Protestants are sympathetic to the New Deal. Because after all, if you think about the message of Jesus, Jesus says we should love the poor, Jesus, you know, the Bible says a rich man is less likely to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And so a lot of American Protestants, including some important Protestant leaders, are saying, yeah, capitalism, as it's been operating, isn't, isn't working. It's not doing enough to take care of the poor and the disadvantaged. And this drives Pew crazy. And so he funds this group called Spiritual Mobilization, based in Southern California, to try to align American Protestantism with free market capitalism. And they do this again through a series of propaganda activities, newsletters, uh, books. They try to influence the curricula in seminary programs across the United States. They have these pledge drives to get uh, Protestant ministers to pledge to um, give sermons on the virtues of the free market and the virtues of unregulated capitalism. And this, I think, I think the circumstantial evidence is that this is very influential because what you see is a shift so that Protestant churches who in America before, say, 1945, 1950, tended to be middle of the road. Maybe they were moderate Republicans or maybe they were centrist Democrats, but weren't really aligned with either extreme end of either party. Today, we have this extremely strong alignment of evangelical Protestantism with the extreme right wing of the Republican Party, including Donald Trump, who you may know is now selling Bibles on the internet, even though this is a man who, as far as I can tell, doesn't have a religious or spiritual bone in his body. Mm. And 
you talked about that the series there, there were strands of activities they were doing and as a student of literature i really like that part of your book where you talk about little house on prairie series i did not know that the author had been deliberately trying to promote a different story which promotes individuality and the dangers of government intervention and i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the series L little house on the prairie can you talk about that and how that author through this series tried to promote this idea of how bad the government is yeah, so this is the single most common thing I get asked about, especially by women who are appalled to find out that these books that we loved as children were actually pieces of libertarian propaganda. So this is a very important example of how the breadth and extent of this these activities and how they permeated into so many different aspects of American life and culture. So The Little House on the Prairie series, as many people know, was one of the most successful children's book series ever written. It's been translated into many, many languages. It has a huge following in Japan, I recently learned. There are even conferences of people, Little House on the Prairie fans, who go to conferences dressed up in period costumes, you know, wearing bonnets and long dresses and such. So these stories were marketed as the true life stories of a young girl, Laura Ingalls Wilder, growing up on the American frontier. And they tell a story of a family succeeding through hard work, through individual initiative, and without help from the government. But the stories weren't true. And in fact, they weren't even written by Laura Ingalls Wilder. It turns out that Laura, the books were actually written by her daughter, the libertarian journalist, writer, and intellectual Rose Wilder Lane. Rose Wilder Lane was a friend of Herbert Hoover. She was a correspondent of Ludwig von Mises, J. Howard Pugh, many of the people we've been talking about. She is in conversation with them trying to help build the intellectual case for laissez-faire economics and against government. And of all of them, she's probably the most extreme. I mean, she wrote a book called, um, oh gosh, it's just slipped my freedom, defense of freedom. I've just forgotten the title. I apologize. Okay. Anyway, in the 19, do you have it in front of you? Uh, no, 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 for a chance. Yeah, it'll come to me. Anyway, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's an astonishingly extreme book. I mean, it's actually hard to read. It's almost incoherent. It has no footnotes as sources. It's filled with claims, some of which are completely demonstrably false about American history. I mean, facts that are just wrong. But basically, it's, it's almost an anarch, anarchist manifesto that everybody should just be allowed to do anything they want and that the collapse of modern civilization is really because of all the energy that is being sucked out of us because we are not actually free. To, free. Um, this book was so extreme that Ludwig von Mises, even in a in in Mises' biography, there's a uh, letter he writes to a friend where he says he says I can't I can't understand Rose Wilder Lane. You know, as far as I can tell, she's a crypto anarchist, which I think is right. I think she was a crypto anarchist, or maybe not even crypto. Anyway, she's very very extremist. She's clearly racist and anti-Semitic. She's also a kind of female misogynist. She doesn't like women. She thinks women are weak. Um, and so she is much happier talking to and associating with men. So I think there's a kind of a bit of female self-loathing going on there. Anyway, she takes the sort of bare rudimentary elements of her mother's story and crafts them into these libertarian parables. And they grossly misrepresent the truth on several levels that we know of for sure. So there are details that we know are false. For example, Laura had a blind sister who was educated because she got to go to a state-funded school in South Dakota, but that's left out of the story. So there's little details like that. But the bigger picture is also deeply misleading because the reality is that the Ingalls family were not successful. Their life was actually a story of repeated failures and disappointments. But Rose recast the story as a success story. Um, and of course, the Wilder the Ingalls Wilder family would never have been on the American plane in the first place had it not been for government action through the Homestead Act, through the land grants, the railroads, and of course, through the clearances of Native American people. But all of that is expunged from the book. So it's a really falsified version of American history, but millions and millions of American girls, myself included, read it thinking that these were true stories. And it gets even worse. There are places in the United States where school teachers, history teachers can use these books and also the television series based on it in history classes on the grounds that these are historical documents, when in fact, they really are works of libertarian propaganda. And, and that also reminds me of a series of 
animations, beautifully made animations. I don't remember the name of the organization in America that they have been making these educational videos about the history of America, uh, but they're deeply, deeply flawed. And there was some research done. Most of the history parts were wrong. I don't remember the name of the organization now anyhow, but it's a right-wing organization. And I think some schools in, in the States have, have been using them in their curriculum. Yeah, and this is a big pattern. I mean, we've seen this in the climate space a lot, that right-wing organizations, uh, business groups will create materials which they call educational, they claim are educational, but they're very misleading, they're very selective, they're cherry-picking data, and then they send these materials to school teachers, including science teachers, who will often use them because they don't realize that they're propagandistic or because they work in underfunded public schools where there, there's a shortage of educational materials. Mm -hmm. So they draw on these materials, even though they're they're quite misleading. And that is a very widespread phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking up Rose Wilder and Lane's book because now I'm telling myself that I can't remember. <laughs> Although the Wikipedia, let's see, it must be here somewhere. Just give me one second. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, here it is. It's called Discovery of Freedom. That's oh, it. Discovery, Discovery of Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. yeah. Um what about the roles of people like Iron Rand? And as a student of literature, I always get uh, right, I love when people tell me that what a great author she is. Well, she's a cult, okay, yes. but she's not a great author anyway. <laughs> no, that's from right. a literary perspective, and also Walt Disney and movie studios. What was their role of these organizations and people in promoting this this story? Mm -hmm. So, one portion of the book talks about popular culture and how these ideas. Um, so, so we've talked already about how trade organizations tried to promote these ideas in school books, also at the University of Chicago, but also in popular culture. And in some ways, that's probably the most important part of the story, because it's really how these arguments get out to uh, lay people, to ordinary Americans across the country. And so they do this in a number of ways, but Hollywood is obviously extremely important, especially in the 40s and 50s, when millions and millions of Americans go to the cinema every weekend. And this is you know, probably the major form of popular entertainment in the United States at this time. So one of the key locations for these activities is Hollywood, where the screenwriter and novelist Ayn Rand has emigrated to and is now working. And so she, as many people know, wrote a set of books that were turned into films glorifying individual effort, demonizing government, basically kind of glorifying. I mean, she's a very strange person because her image of the powerful man, it's almost a kind of Nietzschean ubermensch, uh, has an almost slightly fascistic overplay, even though she herself would say she was anti-fascist. Her family had fled the Soviet Union. Um, she's very hostile to any form of totalitarian government. But at the same time, she promotes a notion of individuality, which is almost quasi-fascistic. And she is able to have her films made in, her books made into films. And the books are wildly successful, the films less so. I mean, actually, the critics mostly didn't like her films. But part of the reason her books are successful, and as you said, these are not great books. I mean, they're superficial, they're trite, but they get promoted by right-wing organizations, mm -hmm. including an institute that gets created in her name, the Rand Institute, that sends out hundreds of thousands of copies of these books, and particularly to high school libraries, so high school students will read them. And I found this very interesting because when I've met people who have read these books and said how much they love them, I often ask, when did you read these books? And there's like, oh, when I was in high school. So I think this actually explains a lot. Her mentality, it seems to me, would clearly appeal to a 15-year-old boy, right? Because when you're a teenager, you're rebelling against your parents. You don't want people to tell you what to do. You think you have the right to do whatever you want. And her heroes are really, they're sort of overgrown 15-year-olds. And so it's not surprising to me that people, that this would appeal to teenagers. What is surprising is that adults, you know, who should know better, who realize, well, no, we don't all just get to do whatever we want because what we do affects other people. Um, but these books have been very successful in part because they've been very heavily promoted by third parties. And the other thing, I mean, one thing that, this wasn't exactly a fun book to write, but, but sometimes there were sort of fun things we uncovered. So this falls into the category of sort of fun. I mean, the unbelievable hypocrisy of these people because they are, argue for freedom for themselves and for wealthy white men while denying the rights of say immigrants or workers to collective bargaining. So Rand herself, while she was writing screenplays in Hollywood celebrating individual freedom was also writing censorship codes.
Mm-hmm. And these codes were adopted by Hollywood and they included things like you shouldn't make a movie that shows bankers in a bad light or you shouldn't make a movie that shows rich people in a bad light. And this was quite significant because in the 30s, there were a lot of screwball comedies made during the Depression that showed rich people as idiots, you know, dumb, ditzy blondes, completely clueless rich guys. So there's this big shift that takes place in Hollywood after World War II, in which now wealthy people and bankers are heroes, whereas before they had been villains. And Rand played a significant role in that change. Mm-hmm. And uh, until last year, last year that Hollywood writers went on strike, I didn't know that um, Reagan was was actually union leader. That was quite a revelation to me, and I was very happy that I read about that in the book. Uh, how his career, and he wasn't a great actor in that sense, maybe, but his career sort of took off after Gen- General Electric Corporations started this TV show, General Electric Theater. Can you talk about him and how? Let's say how 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 we got into these ideas, and also the more importantly, the influence of someone called uh, Lemuel, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Ricketts Spolward that you discuss in the book. Yeah. So again, if just to paint the landscape a little bit, so we have this discussion that explains how these ideas were were pushed into academia and intellectual life. Then we show how they're pushed into popular culture, film, television, radio. But there's an additional question then, and maybe the most important question in the book, how do these become mainstream in American politics? Because as we've said, FDR wins the argument over the New Deal. And after 1932, these free market arguments are really in retreat. And there's no major political candidate who argues for these positions, not Democratic, not Republican. So... After FDR dies, we have Harry Truman. After Truman, we have Dwight Eisenhower, who's a Republican, but he expands Social Security. And there's this famous letter he writes where he says, anyone who tried to get rid of Social Security now, you know, they'd be laughed at. And he says, well, there are a few people who want to do this, but they're idiots. (laughs) You know, so this is a Republican president and the marginal tax rate under Dwight Eisenhower is 92 percent. So Eisenhower embraces what is essentially a kind of modified New Deal compromise, Kennedy the same, Johnson the same. Nixon tries to push back a little bit, but doesn't really succeed. But it's really with Ronald Reagan that things shift. And Reagan begins to try to undo a lot of the New Deal, what we could call, or what historians have called the New Deal consensus. So where does Reagan come from? As you said, Reagan was a second-rate actor. He had appeared in a lot of sort of stupid Hollywood comedies with chimpanzees. And he had been the, a Democrat and the president of a labor union, the Screen Actors Guild, the same people who were just on strike a few months ago. So where does he come from? And how does this transformation get affected that he goes from being a New Deal Democrat to an anti-union, anti-government Republican? Well, we did a bunch of digging to try to answer that question. And you won't find the answer in many of his biographies because the biographies are hagiographic. But the evidence is out there. Between his work in Hollywood and his running for office, he worked for General Electric Corporation, which was one of the companies that had been involved in the NILA propaganda campaigns back in the 1920s, as the host of a television show called General Electric Theater. The show was extremely popular. It was very well done. I spent a whole day in the Reagan Library watching television. That was fun. <laughs> and and he had and because he had been in Hollywood, he knew a lot of successful actors. So he was able to recruit a lot of really talented people, like Harry Belafonte, for example, uh, showed up. Uh, Fred Astaire. Lots of famous names were on this program. And it was very, very well done. But it also had this subtext that ran through not all of the episodes, but many of them of success through individual enterprise, hard work, rolling up your sleeves, standing up for yourselves. Some of the stories involve children who go running to their parents for help. And the dad says, no, son, you have to stand up and take care of this on your own. There's one particularly offensive episode about a man who's suffering from alcoholism and his friends beg him to get help. And in the end, he says, no, this is my responsibility. Nobody poured that alcohol down my throat but me. I've got to do this on my own. So it's all this these didactic stories of individualism without help from the government. Because this show was so successful, Reagan became very, very famous. He became one of the most famous people in America in the late 1950s, being on this show. And he became a persona that almost everyone in America knew who he was because 
the show was very popular. People would turn on the television in their homes. So Ronald Reagan as an affable, amiable persona now is part of American life. And so people know him. And he uses this then to launch a career, but also a career now as a conservative Republican. And where do those ideas come from? Well, his boss at GE was a man named Lemuel Boulware, the one you just mentioned, who was famous for his anti-union tactics. GE was a company that was good to work for in some ways. They paid their employees well, but it was actually extremely anti-union and actually had been sanctioned by the U.S. National Labor Relations Board for violations of um, the right to collective bargaining and for bad faith activities in union bargaining. Boulware had organized an internal propaganda campaign inside the corporation, promoting the ideas of von Hayek, von Mises, also a right-wing journalist named Henry Hazlitt, and they would distribute reading lists to, to managers and supervisors, organize book clubs to encourage their supervisors to read these materials, pro-market, anti-government materials, anti-taxation. They also had a little General Electric University where people could come and spend a few days, managers could come and be versed in these pro-market, anti-union, anti-government activities. And Reagan, as part of his work for GE, half of his job was, was appearing on television, but the other half was going around the country giving lectures, promoting Bulware's ideas. So what we show in the book is that through this process of representing GE, Reagan came to accept the GE philosophy. And one of his own biographers, who's an admiring biographer, says, yeah, it's actually astonishing how much Reagan's views came to resemble that of his boss, Bulware. And we're like, yeah, exactly. So he's completely transformed by this experience. So he leaves GE uh, to launch a political campaign to run for governor of California, even though he's never held any elected office, well, except I guess the Screenwriters Guild president, I guess that was elected. Um, but the other key part of the story is he's bankrolled by GE executives. So they both give him the script, they give him the exposure, and they give him the money to launch his campaign for government governor, and he wins. And then from there, he begin to bring, begins to bring these ideas into mainstream Republican Party politics. And again, he doesn't succeed right away. He doesn't get the nomination in 1968. Ronald Reagan gets it after, sorry, uh, Richard Nixon gets it after Nixon steps down in disgrace. Gerald Ford becomes president, but then he tries again in 1980 and he wins. Um, I have one final question. Which, which, which has always been on my mind, and I've spoken with it with several other of my guests, uh, and it's about the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Because yeah. on the one side you have capitalism, you have big corporates, and on the other hand you have governments. And I've been talking about it with some of my friends here in Australia. We have a labor government in place, but they still they pass laws that benefit the big corporates because they have to, otherwise they won't be in power. And then what's the democratic democratic part of it? So do do you think? capitalism is inherently anti-democratic, or let's say if economic liberalization can lead to political liberalization or political liberty, let's say? Well, the second part of that question is easy to answer because that was Milton Friedman's argument that you should always support economic liberalization because with the distribution of economic power, you would get the distribution of political power and therefore economic liberalization would lead to political liberalization. We know now that that is absolutely false because we've had multiple experiments. Chile is the most egregious one, but China is the biggest and most obvious one. So it's absolutely clear the evidence is irrefutable that economic liberalization does not necessarily lead to political liberalization. In theory, it could, but in many cases, it doesn't. So the bigger question about capitalism and democracy, well, we need another hour to talk about that, but I'll just give you my kind of brief gloss on this. So there's a very interesting book recently written by Martin Wolf. Um, who's the editor at the Financial Times. And it's a very, it's called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. And it's a very thoughtful book, and I like and respect Martin Wolf. And he argues, a kind, it's a kind of complicated argument in tension. On the one hand, he says, look, capitalism is failing us in some really significant ways. There are these big threats to democracy. But on the other hand, capitalism and democracy go hand in hand. They grew up together. They're both rooted in the notion of individual rights and individual choice. And so... We have to figure out some way to hold on to the good things about capitalism, but fix this kind of little problem we've got going on with democracy. And he says at the end, it's we have to reclaim a notion of citizenship. Well, I think that's a very 
sad and weak ending for what's otherwise a really important book. So I definitely encourage people to read the book, maybe in the hopes of stimulating a better conversation about the remedy. Because the way I view it is, there is some historical point to the argument that capitalism and democracy, at least in the Anglo-American, English-speaking West, Anglophone West, that they did develop more or less around the same time. And so one question is, is that just a coincidence or is there something intrinsic there? And I think that the argument that there might be something at least somewhat intrinsic in terms of the notion of individual rights and individual choice. So there may be something to that, but, and here's the giant but in all capital letters, mm -hmm. look at what has happened in the world today. Today, capitalism is threatening democracy because the giant concentration of wealth in the hands of a small, tiny number of people is completely undermining democracy. And we have examples of this all across the world. So in the United States, where I live, and it's obviously the example I know the best, but I've also lived in Australia, spent a lot of time in Europe. We have so much evidence that the American people support gun control, support reproductive rights, support voting rights, want a pluralistic multicultural society. On so many levels, the American people are on board with a progressive agenda, but it's not what we're getting out of our government. And the reasons are obvious because huge concentrations of wealth turn into concentrations of political power. And that's not a brand new thought. That is something that people have recognized for a long time. So again, using the American case, in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed to break up the big monopolies that had developed during the Gilded Age. And if you read the speeches that John Sherman made in Congress, which we did for this book, one of the things he says is, it's not just about protecting competition, although that's important and good. So in, a way, in other words, in a way, protecting capitalism from capitalists, but it's also about protecting democracy, because when people become too rich and too wealthy, they can corrupt the political process. And so the Sherman antitrust law passed 130 years ago was specifically written because of that recognition of the way concentration of wealth threatens democracy. And now here we are 120, 130 years later, and we are facing the exact same problem all over again. Mm. So I think that it's completely clear that capitalism as currently practiced is a giant threat to democracy. And unless we can figure out some other way, um, you know, some way to address these massive concentrations of wealth, I think we are, we are in a very, very perilous place. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the concentrations of wealth are not just restricted to the United States. You have it in Australia, you have it in Europe, you know, and, and then look at the oligarchs in Russia as well. So mm -hmm. this has really become a global problem. And um, it's something we really have to address. Mm -hmm. and, and just to follow up on that, I, I work with a lot of publishers about their books. And I've just recently noticed, it just dawned on me that there have been a lot of books on the uh, decline of democracy, the, the rise of dictatorship on authoritarianism it seems that there is this recognition and a lot of academics are writing about how democracy can easily be lost and it's just a recent thread i guess in the five past seven or eight years i'm looking at the publications and i see a lot of these new titles written by academics uh famous academics and they're not really just a book that somebody writes to get published uh so it, it is unfortunately a trend, and I really hope something good can come out of it. Um, I agree. It, yeah. I agree. <laughs> Before we end this conversation, I always ask if there's any other book you project you're working on, any other brilliant book we should be waiting for a couple, in a couple of years. <laughs> well, Anything you wrote this, this, turned out to be a great Thank book. you. That's so nice of you to say. Well, this book was a heavy lift. Uh, Eric Conway yeah. and I worked on it for five years, so 10 person years. Um, and there's a lot in it, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very complicated book with a lot of material. So one of the things I'm thinking about doing is um, maybe pulling out some of the key themes into a shorter book. And I've just finished writing an article based on the chapter about Adam Smith. So I am thinking about the possibility of a short book um, of just about Adam Smith. But mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> that, that is uh, a great I, idea, I guess, because I said you. to my friend, it's a pity that this book is not published with someone like you know, Penguin, some of those commercial publishers, if they ever publish it, because so that more and more people can read and understand about this, this, this myth of the bad government, let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe that's next. We'll see. So uh, thanks for absolutely. asking that. Uh, Professor Nami Oreskes, thank you very, very much for your time to talk with us about your book, The Big Myth, How American Business, uh, Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market, published by Bloomsbury. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.